This is reminding all men that tonight at 6 o'clock in the Smith Center, we're having food and fellowship. 6 o'clock tonight in the Smith Center. Chit Chat and Girlfriends join together in February for a special time of fellowship. We will meet at 5.30 p.m. on Friday, February the 9th at Chick-fil-A and then on to STC for the heartfelt drama, Steel Magnolias. Pastor Brandy needs to meet with the parents of all students attending Winterfest Sunday morning, February the 11th, following the morning service in the Smith Center. February the 11th in the Smith Center. Golden Nuggets, it's time to get ready for our February fellowship. We meet Tuesday night, February the 20th at 6.30 in the Smith Center. Young Adults, your February Fellowship will be at Pastor Brandy's Sunday, February the 25th at 4 p.m. You know that food and fellowship is always tops when you go to the Lumley. Invite someone to join you Sunday the 25th at 4 p.m. at the Lumley. You can stay up to date with our many activities by logging on to our social media platforms. Well, those are the announcements for the week, and should you need Pastor Josh or the staff, please do not hesitate to give us a call. May God bless, and we'll see you next week. Good morning. It's good to see you. Y'all look great this morning. Everybody's smiling and chipper, even though it's cold outside. How many of you are glad to be in the house of the Lord? Amen. Uh, so yesterday, our girls club, um, they went to Tifton to our state campground, and we had our big girls day out it was called extravagant and how god's love is extravagant and we we won a couple of awards corey laisha will y'all stand up please um these are two of our girls club leaders and they do an incredible job on wednesday night can you just tell them how thankful we are for them yes amen so our joy bells got um so this is for girls ministry of the year for all of south georgia um and so our joy bells got runner up and also our bluebells got runner up. So we are we are just so proud of our girls. They are, man, we have some of the best little girls. Um, they're fun and they just love the Lord. Um, I love getting our, our photos and our videos of them singing on Wednesday night. It it's just, just blesses my heart. And I'm so thankful because as a parent of one of those little girls, I know and I see how much they are being invested in and they are being taught about the word and how to love Jesus. And that is one of the most important things we can do as a church. Amen. Amen. So this morning, uh, we just, I want to uh, just hit the offering, the giving. Um, it, we have our giving station in the foyer. Drop it in there. Uh, you can give online. We have the app. You can even text it. However you're comfortable, whatever is easiest, it is there for you. If you'll go ahead and stand with me this morning. Um, and Anthony, if you'll put that, uh, that prayer slide up, I want to hit that just for just a moment. We've got several needs. Uh, we want to continue to remember Miss Catherine and Miss Diane. Um, and then we have several uh, family and friends. Uh, Rhett Carter is back. He is at home. He's doing well. He's still got a long road of recovery. Uh, Gracie Clifton, uh, Jackson Johnson. And my, I did, I put my uncle up here. I, I shared a Several of you have been praying already for him, and I shared an update this morning, but if you will continue to remember him, uh, he has got a very long road ahead of him, but I am thankful for what God has already done, and I am believing that in all of these needs, God is going to be the one to get the glory in those. Amen? Amen. This morning, I want to read from Psalms 96, and it's verses 1 through 4, and it says this, sing to the Lord a new song. Amen? Sing to the Lord all the earth. Sing to the Lord, bless his name, proclaim, proclaim good tidings of his salvation from day to day. Tell of his glory among the nations, his wonderful deeds among all people, all the peoples. For, the, for great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. 
He is to be feared above all gods. He is to be feared above all things. You know, the psalmist here is identifying God as the one true Lord that reigns over all the earth. How many of you would say amen to that? He is the maker of all things. And, and I don't know about you, but I know of all the wonderful and amazing things that God has done in my life. And I'm so thankful that I get to proclaim of his goodness and the salvation that he has done in my heart and in my life. How many of you can testify to that same thing? Amen. Heavenly Father, we just come to you today. Father, just to thank you, to praise you, Father, to exalt and extol your mighty, mighty name, Lord, your mighty works, Lord, that we have already seen in our lives. God, you know each and every need, Lord, that we have listed on our prayer slide. God, and I pray that you would move in a mighty way. Lord, for healing in those bodies that need it, Father, we just pray and ask for divine miracles, Lord, to take, to take place. Lord, we just love you today. And God, we are coming here, Lord, as a, as a body of believers in one mind and one accord just to lift up your name, to sing praises to you today, Father, to proclaim of your goodness and of our salvation that you have done in us. Lord, the work, the amazing work of salvation, Lord, in our lives. And Father, we just give you all the praise and honor and glory. And in Jesus' name, amen and amen. Amen. It's good to be in the house of the Lord. We want to welcome you. We want to welcome the ones online joining us. We want you just to worship God this morning as we sing and we worship and we give God honor and praise and glory.
know this song just simply says, believe for it. This is one of my favorites. And I don't know about you, but there are some things right now that I'm believing for. How many of you could say that I need, I'm believing for some things in my life or in my family's life? And this is such a wonderful song to proclaim to the God who can make it all possible, to the God of miracles. They say this mountain can be moved. They say these chains will never break. But they don't know you like we do. There is power in your name. We've heard that there is no way through. We've heard the tides will never change. But they haven't seen.
said it for me. Yes, you did. You said it. I believe it. You said it. It is done. You said it. I believe it. You Every miracle we are needing, Lord, you said it. It is done right here, right now. Right here, right now. Have your way, Lord. Have your way. You said it. It is done. You said it. I love you, Lord. Oh, your mercy never fails me. In all my days, I've been held in your hands. From the moment that I wake up until I lay my head and I will see all the good
seated this morning. I've uh, had every intention of getting up here and preaching today on, and continue my series devoted and preaching on koinonia and fellowship. Um, but God has worked something different in me this morning. And so I'm going to preach something different to you. And I hope that's all right. Don't plan on preaching real long. I believe God wants to and needs to do something in this altar today. Not just in me but in every one of us. And I know some of you will not take the opportunity for God to work on you in the altar. And that's very sad. But at the same time, the message today is for all of us, needed by all of us. And I hope you will give me your undivided attention for just a few moments. And um, as we dive into this, I want to read something to you before I get started. Because I, I wrote this for a newspaper article several years ago in Jessup. Um, as part of a, uh, an article that I wrote, um, and this was really my intro, um, and so it may bore you a second as I read this, but I want you to listen to the words, and I'm going to quote several times in this uh, a man by the name of Frederick Douglass. Anybody know who Frederick Douglass was? Anybody ever read The Life and Times of Frederick Douglass? White people don't normally read that. We're against that. We think it don't have nothing to do with us, but I believe that in order for a person to be able to vote, they should have to read that book. That's what I believe. Uh, but I want to read to you, just this, this, and I just want you to listen closely, because the message that we get from what I'm going to share with you is important for all of us. As an enslaved person, the great abolitionist Frederick Douglass learned that whoever was whipped easiest was whipped most often. Douglass did not just witness this in others, but proved it himself. In 1834, Douglass to the slave breaker, Mr. Covey, Douglas tells of the moment when he became a man and fought back against the scourging brought by Mr. Covey. Douglas gave as good as he received, and he said it was a glorious resurrection from the tomb of slavery to the heaven of freedom. Douglas resolved that the white man who expected to succeed in whipping must also succeed in killing me. From that moment on, Douglas was never again fairly whipped. After that, though, he had several fights, but was never whipped. I don't know about you. I love history. I love reading those thoughts and, 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 and understanding a little bit about what him as well as others went through. Frederick Douglass, he was afforded, uh, when he was young, the chance to go and be a slave in a household in Baltimore. While he was there, the master's wife taught him how to read. It's one of the greatest things that she could have done for him. In fact, he would, he would teach other poor kids on the street how to read. And they would give him food. Um, and, but Frederick Douglass, after being in that house, was sent back to the plantation. So they sent him to this Mr. Covey because he was the guy that broke the slaves. And they felt like Frederick Douglass needed to be rebroke since he had spent time in the house. And it was there that Frederick Douglass realized that the person that's whipped the most is whipped the easiest. And so he decided in himself that he wasn't going to take a whipping so easy anymore. And he fought back. And there's people that say, oh, that ain't really a true story. That was just his own thoughts and what he wanted us to know. But I would have you know that Frederick Douglass challenged Mr. Covey to a public debate to prove that what he was saying was true. And Mr. Covey would not meet him 
on the public square. There's a lot of lessons to be learned here from what Frederick Douglass teaches us. Because there's so many Christians who walk around in slavery. And you get whipped by the enemy over and over and over again. We're probably all guilty of that. Sometimes we don't even realize we're in slavery. Some of us are in slavery to music. You sit back and pout because they don't sing your style. Or they don't sing enough of your style. You're in slavery. You are bound by the enemy. Some of you are bound because you refuse to worship with people of different skin color. You're in slavery. Some of you are enslaved to sin or drugs or whatever else may be going on in your life. You have uh, this slavery that you must allow Christ to set you free from. Galatians chapter 5, verse 1. I promise you I won't be real long today. I just got a couple of things I need to share with you. And I'm going to go to three different scriptures and, and hopefully do them justice. I literally wrote these notes a half hour ago in my office before I came out. Paul tells us in Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, that it was for freedom that Christ sets us free. It was for freedom. What does that tell us? What is the Apostle Paul telling us right here in this opening remarks? He's telling us that God wants us free. Not partially free, not partially bound. He wants us totally and completely free. He doesn't want us bound by politics, which most of you are. He doesn't want us bound by, by religion. He doesn't want us bound by a church. He doesn't want us bound by anything. He wants us totally and completely free in Christ Jesus. It's amazing. Most time we'll read that verse and we skip right over that part. I've heard a lot of preachers focus on the last part. Therefore, keep standing firm. Do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. And certainly I could preach a message right here. But I want you to know by reading this, and I want you to know that God wants you free. It's not the role of a Christian to walk around bound and weighed down and defeated and whipped all the time. But the person that the enemy finds is easiest to whip is the one he's going to whip over and over and over again. We must resolve to be like Frederick Douglass and say, if he's going to whip me, he's going to have to kill me. We must be, have this mentality where we're going to stand firm, we're going to stand strong, and the next time they go to whip me, they're going to know that I'm going to fight back. It's become too easy in the church for us to make excuses for the things that we struggle with. There's plenty of you who are ashamed of the things you struggle with. You won't share them with nobody, even if God put them in your path to help you defeat that thing. We don't want to share it. We want to keep it to ourselves, And that's exactly what the enemy wants, because if, if you keep it to yourself and you hold it in, it will destroy you from the inside out. There's people in this room who are more concerned about church finances than they are about paying tithes. You're bound. You have a problem. You know what I'm concerned about? Winning the lost. Making disciples for Jesus Christ. And if that's not what you want, you voted for the wrong guy. I'm not here to play patty cake and have church on Sunday morning. I'm here to see people set free by the power of Jesus Christ. And if you don't like it, the best thing to do is maybe either sit back and be quiet or perhaps find another place to worship. Because we are moving forward. We're going to advance the kingdom. We're going to make disciples. I don't care if it's around the coffee table. I don't care if it's in the fellowship hall. I don't care if it's, if it's at the axe throwing place. I don't care where it's at. We're going to make disciples for Jesus Christ. You know why? Because that's what God has called us to do. There's people in here need to be set free today. And God wants you to be free. Your opinion don't mean jack squat. I've told you that. I don't care what you think. I don't care what you think about me. I don't care if you think I'm a bad priest. I don't care. You know why? Because you don't give me my anointing. You don't give me the wisdom I need to decipher the scriptures. I don't care what you think. The only thing I care about is reaching somebody for Jesus Christ. I probably shouldn't say this. I'm going to say it anyway. And, and this ain't got nothing to do with you got to do with somebody else I got a brother who's so strung out right now 
And he's sitting in the Wayne County Jail. And I'm grateful that he's sitting in Wayne County Jail. Because I'm praying and I'm believing. He hadn't called me. He's been there for four days. He hadn't called me yet. He called my sister. But I know it's because he's ashamed. He don't want to tell me nothing. But I know that it won't be long and he'll be that desperate. He'll be calling me trying to get me to pull some strings to help him get out. But I've been pr I'm praying that God is going to reach him. Whether it's through that jail cell or through some rehab that I can help get him into or through something. I'm praying that when he comes out that he's a totally different person. I've been, I've been in this game long enough. I have dealt with, I have sat in that Wayne County Jail across from people. I've seen jailhouse religion at its best. But I've also seen the delivering power of God. And God has the ability to help people. And that's what I believe. I, I, he could sit there for six months. I, I would be glad for that as long as when he gets done, he's free in Christ. That's what I'm hoping for. And it's people like that. It's why I do ministry. Listen, I, I'm, I'm beginning to love all of you, and I enjoy fellowshipping with you, and we're going to have a great fellowship tonight, man. We're going to have a good time together. We're going to build those relationships. But I'm not in it for that. I can do that anywhere. I'm in it to see people saved and delivered and, and discipled for Jesus Christ. Hopefully you get to know me a little bit today. I don't back down. I will fight you. Spiritually, physically, whatever we got to do, we'll do it. And I will always do it for what's right. I don't care about your political beliefs. I don't care where you stand on Frederick Doug. I don't care. That doesn't mean anything to me. The only thing that matters to me is the gospel of Jesus Christ and doing what he's called me to do. And there ain't no person or their bad attitude going to stand in the way of that. And if you won't let God set you free today, like I said, just sit back and be quiet or maybe find another place to worship. God wants you free. God wants those around you free. He does. He wants all of us free. That's why Christ came, to set us free. He, 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 we are free because that's what God wants. And God wants us to be totally free. Don't set yourself up for slavery again. Don't go dibble and dabble in that thing that you were bound by. For some of you, it's gossip and slander. Y'all better hear me on this. That's one of the things God hates. But the church is full of gossip and slander. You know why somebody won't share nothing with you? Because they're scared you're going to go tell everybody. And I don't blame them. I ain't telling you nothing either. That ain't what the church is supposed to be. I'm sorry this is different and hateful. We got some great visitors here today. I'm not, I, I had none of that planned, by the way. I'm just letting you know the line is drawn in the sand. I dare you to cross it. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. This is where God got my mind rolling this morning. And uh, I think every song they did was about freedom. It's about freedom today. It's amazing how God just confirms those things as you go. But somebody needs to hear this today. How many know we don't wrestle against flesh and blood? Right? We don't wrestle. But the devil will certainly use flesh and blood, and usually it's those that's closest to you. And a lot of times they don't even realize what they're doing. Paul tells us, and y'all really hear this verse. Please hear this. There is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. There is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. Condemnation means that you have, have or you are guilty, you've been tried, and you have been sentenced. You've been condemned. How I many know we're in Christ Jesus, we don't have condemnation. We might be guilty of some stuff. But it was the condemnation that belongs to me that Christ took on himself. And so if I'm in Christ Jesus, there is no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. However, 
most of us at certain times will walk around and we will feel condemned for something that we did. Can I get a witness, somebody? I hope it ain't just me. We'll feel condemned. But what Paul is screaming to us right here is if you feel condemnation and you're in Christ Jesus, that ain't God. That comes from the enemy. He wants you to feel condemned. He wants you to feel defeated. He wants you to feel like you have no hope. He he wants you to feel like you can never be forgiven. And at the same time, he wants you to be condemnation for somebody else. He wants you to take that thing they did and drive it as deep as you can and twist that knife and keep twisting that thing until they give up. He wants you to be the condemnation for someone else. He wants you to never let that thing go, but to keep holding on and keep trying to do damage. And that's exactly what you'll do, by the way. The reason why the Bible tells us to work out our own salvation. It's not your job to condemn someone else. It's not your job to point fingers and blame somebody or talk about what somebody did 20 years ago. It's not your place. If God is refusing to condemn, what makes you think you have the right? The longer you hold things over someone's head, the longer you will keep them in a place of brokenness and defeat. You know, a pastor's job is to protect the sheep. I will fight for the sheep. I will protect the sheep. Verse 3, and they're not going to put this on the screen. Paul t- in Romans 8, 3, Paul tells us that God sent his son in the likeness of sinful flesh. It's a powerful statement. And as an offering for sin, comma. Then the next statement, this is what he says. Listen, God's not condemning you, but God has condemned sin in the flesh. He condemns sin. He doesn't condemn us if we're in Christ Jesus. Now, if we're not in Christ Jesus, we have something terrible to look forward to. Because you don't want God to condemn you. But thankfully that we can be in Christ Jesus, we don't have to worry about being condemned. By, it doesn't matter what so-and-so says. It doesn't matter what society says about you or what that church said. It doesn't matter what that person thinks. It doesn't matter. We get so beat up by people and by the enemy because we get whipped so easy over that thing we did back then. And we need to realize today that there is therefore now no condemnation to those that are in Christ Jesus. I might have been guilty. I might have done something I shouldn't have done. But God has forgiven me. And Christ has took my condemnation upon himself. That's, that's, that's a glorious thing to know. That's the gospel. That is the gospel message for you. It's not about how much money you got in the bank or what kind of car you drive. The gospel is you were an enemy of Christ. You were condemned and you were in a a bad place, but Jesus stepped in. Let me show you Colossians chapter 2. I won't be much longer, I promise. Beginning in verse 13, Paul says, When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he made you alive together with him, having forgiven. Notice that word. Forgiven. It's already done. He's already forgiven us. It gets better. Watch this. All our transgressions. Verse 14. Having, let's see, people will hold that certificate of debt, but God doesn't. People will hold that over your head. The enemy will hold that over your head. But the only one that matters is God. Look at this. And he's canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of of decrees against us, which was an enemy to us. Look at this. He's taking it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. I love that. You already you probably already know Colossians, one of my favorites. It's my favorite Pauline letter, and I love it. What we see here is this amazing thing. 
That where when I come to Christ and I put my trust in Christ, He forgives me. Right? He, he's cleansed me. He's, he's made me whole. He's, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Get this new birth happening. This regeneration where God begins to heal me of all the damage and all the things that I've let sin do to me. He begins to cleanse me and make me whole. This beautiful process of transformation begins. But Paul tells us, and those, those things that we hold on to, those things that we let the enemy use, attacks us and destroys us. It's hostile to us. But so many of us hold on to those things. And we let other people hold on to those things. But it's time to draw a line in the sand. It's time to say, I'm not like that anymore. Things are going to be different. Why? Because I have Christ. Christ is taking it out of the way. Some of you need to let God have it today. Some of you need to let God have it. You need to worry about working out your own salvation. You need to let God have those things that are destroying you. Let him take it and nail them to the cross. Verse 15. When he had disarmed the rulers and authorities. You know, and once again, it's the enemy that fuels these, this condemnation. It's the enemy that fuels that, that unforgiveness. It's the enemy that fuels all that stuff. And Paul says he made a public display. I mean, no, he's a defeated foe. The only victory the enemy has is the victory that you let him have. The only power he has over you is the power that you allow him to have. And he loves having it. But he made a public display of the enemy that whips us so easy. He triumphed over them through him. Now let me, I'm, I'm not going to read this. If you got your Bible, you can read along and, and see where I'm at. But I just want to point out a couple of things here before I uh, end this. In verse 16, Paul tells us that we are to let no one act as your judge. He didn't mention some specific things here, but I want you to know that covers everything. Don't let anyone act as your judge because you're in Christ. Don't let anyone act as your judge because he's the judge. And he hasn't condemned you. Don't let anyone act as your judge. Verse 18, he says, let no one. Keep defrauding you of your prize. Once again, there's some specifics he mentions. But I want you to know that when we let people have power, if we let the enemy have power over us through condemnation or unforgiveness or anything, we're letting him or them defraud us of the prize. Remember, Christ is our prize, and God wants you to be free. So what's Paul saying? He's saying when you let people have that power, if you let the enemy have that power, you're never going to be totally free. That's not what God wants for you. He wants you to be totally free. He don't want you dependent on any person or anything for anything, any, anything in your life. He wants you to be totally dependent upon him. Doesn't mean he won't use people. Doesn't mean he won't, won't use people to help you. It doesn't mean any of that. What it means is, we get, he's our source, not people. He's my source, not my job. He's my source, not the government. Right? Not my doctor, not my pills, not anything else. He's the source. And anytime we let someone defraud us, we're not going to be able to walk in true freedom. Verse 18, he mentions that a lot of this is caused because they're fleshly minds are inflated. Do you know people will hold stuff against you that ain't even true? People will come against you with garbage. They'll sit back at their house all by themselves and read your Facebook post and begin to imagine some kind of a scheme to make you look bad. Because they sit there in their fleshly, sin-filled minds will create something that's not even true. 
There's some in here right now probably puffed up me for what I said a little while ago. And your mind is inflating it so big. Oh, I'm going to call it over so gonna, he done told me to find another church to go to. I hope I'm talking about you. I got his number. Straight to his cell phone if you need it. Council probably has it too. Our minds will sit there and dwell on things that somebody did to us. And sometimes it's not even as bad as we think, but we let our minds inflate it so big to where we got to have counseling to even forgive somebody. We got to have this and that. We got to have this happen. And oh, God, we got to have revival or it's not going to work. It was for freedom that Christ set you free. He wants your mind free from that junk. Sometimes we make enemies out of people that are not our enemies. By the way, I'm not your enemy. You don't want me to be your enemy. Verse 19, Paul talking about those people with those inflated minds. He says they don't do something, the most important thing. He says they don't hold fast to the head. What I'm getting out of that, I'm telling you today, what you need to do is hold fast to Christ. He's the head. We have to hold fast to Jesus Christ. We have to hold on and refuse to let go. The enemy wants you to let go. He wants you to give up. He wants to wear you out with, with things that don't even matter until you give up. Hold fast to Christ. Not just, not just one little holding by one little pinky. I would tell you not even be like that woman with the issue of blood. Don't grab the hem of his garment. Grab a hold around his leg and refuse to let go. Are you hearing me? Hold fast to Christ. I can confidently stand up here today and tell you that most Christians in America do not hold fast to Christ. How do I know that? Because I can tell by the way you live. We can tell by looking at your checkbook. That's the words of Christ there. Where your heart's at, that's where you, right? There's some things we can tell about you based on what you do. If all you do is sit back and grumble and complain about what's going on, but you don't do anything to help, keep it to yourself. Let God free you from that. Let God set you free. The greatest thing you and I can do today is not take and put an offering in the offering bucket out there. I know what TBN preachers will tell you. That ain't the greatest thing you can do. The greatest thing you can do today in your life, in your walk with Christ, in your family, is to grab a hold of Jesus and never let him go. You ain't got to have it all together. You ain't got to have it all right. You ain't got to be all free. Because if you grab a hold of him, he'll help you get it all together. There's this dude I know in Wayne County, great, one of the greatest guys you'll meet. Fantastic dude. I mean, he just, but he struggles with stuff. I'd be like, come to church, man. I'm going to come, man. Let, let me get this together first. Let me, let, me stop, let me stop doing this and I'll come. I told him, I said, man, you're not going to be able to do it without Jesus. But so many of us try to do it without Jesus. But that's not what God designed. And the reason we're not truly free in Christ is because we're trying to do things without Christ. Anybody read uh, Augustine Confessions? Anybody? Um, it was a long time ago. A thousand years ago now, I guess. <laughs> long time ago. But <clears throat> Augustine, tell, in his confessions, I mean, he, he's got some of the most eye-opening thoughts that you could ever ponder. But, and, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing this. And Augustine, if you don't know, he is one of the great leaders in the history of the church. He makes the statement in there that what he thought was freedom wasn't freedom. He struggled with, with sexual immorality. He, he, would, he would bounce from woman to woman. I mean, he'd done all these, these things. He, he, was a, he was a man. He, he struggled with some stuff. 
Um, but he said that what he realized, and he tried different religions and different schools of thought. He'd done all these different things. But it wasn't until he found Christ. And he said in that book, he, he tells us that, that he, he looked for freedom in everything else. He said, I look for it in wisdom. He said, I even look for it in myself. By the way, you can't find freedom in yourself. You need Jesus. He said, I look for it all over the place, but it wasn't until I found Christ that I knew what freedom really was. That's amazing. Because here we are, a thousand years later, still wrestling and still struggling with the same thoughts and the same struggles. The solution for Augustine is the solution for you. And that's Jesus. We like to circle ourselves with new things, new relationships, and new circle of friends, and new a job, and a new church, and a new this, and new that. But no matter where we go, listen, and I'm very experienced in this, no matter what church you go to, the same problems exist. You know why? Because we all deal with the same stuff. And the solution is the same for all of us, and it's Christ. Hold on to Christ. If y'all want to come play, I'm finished. Like I said, I, I believe God wants to do something in this place today in this altar. It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Sometimes we get bound by unforgiveness. We get bound by what people think about us. We get bound by how much money we have. I mean, I've seen Christians who are so happy when they got money in the bank. But boy, their world falls apart when the money runs out. You know why? They're not holding on to Christ. No matter what you walk through in life, if you hold on to Christ, you'll be able to, to weather anything. You'll be able to make it. Like we talked about on Wednesday night. This is true. There's no way the Apostle Paul would have gladly went to the guillotine. No way the Apostle Peter would have gladly been crucified upside down. It's true. Christ is real. Christ is our solution. Christ is our Savior. Christ is our freedom. Christ is our peace. If you'll stand with me. Like I said earlier, this message for every one of us here, myself included. Every one of us needs to be in this altar. That's not a ploy to try to ride your emotions to the altar. Because I've been this long enough to know that some of you ain't going to come. It don't matter if horses were tied to you and drug you down here, you wouldn't have come down here. I know. I've, I've been in this thing long enough. What I want you to know, though, is that God wants you free. And freedom is found in Jesus Christ. I'm going to pray. This altar's open. Come find a place. I'm going to find me a place. Let's pray. Listen, don't let condemnation destroy you. Don't be the condemnation for somebody else. Don't let the enemy use you that way. Freedom in Christ. Father, we love you so much. We thank you for all you do. Thank you for this service. I thank you for your word. I thank you for the examples that you give us, God. I thank you, Lord, for the freedom that we have in Christ. Set us free today, God. Lord, whether we, have, we struggle with what people think about us, whether we're struggling with something we did a long time ago, no matter what it is, I pray in Jesus' name that we would encounter the freedom that Christ gives us today. Set us free from those thoughts. Set us free from every attack of the enemy. Set us free from every puffed up imagination, God. Set us free today, Lord Jesus. Have your way, God, across this house. Thank you, Jesus. They say this mountain can be moved. They say these chains will never But they don't know you like we do. There is power in your name. 
bodies. You said it, Lord, we're going to believe it right here, right now. Oh, there might be a marriage that's breaking. Oh, but there's restoration. There is healing in our hearts. You said it, Lord, we believe.
with renewal in our hearts leaving with addictions broken right here oh we're leaving with marriages restored and promises of a hope and a future hallelujah you are Amen. It's one of the services that a pastor hates to end. So I'm not going to end it. I will give you the liberty to be dismissed whenever you're ready, but you can linger as long as you want to. Men, remember 6 o'clock tonight, fellowship in the Smith Center. We'll have a, an array of sausage and um, just have a good time together. So please come, invite somebody with you, and I will share a message and share a couple of things, announcements with you as well. So we'll have a good time tonight, 6 o'clock. Wednesday night, 6.30, we will continue an apologetic series. Um, so this week we'll talk about the problem of evil. And so looking forward to that one. God is so good, amen. So we love you. I pray that you have a blessed day. And I'll, man, I'll see you tonight. Everybody else, see you Wednesday night.